It doesn't matter. We'll get you, we're going to get everybody. So. All right. My name's Ricky Scott, um, chairman of the uh, Commercial Fishing Advisory Committee. And uh, like Mike said, uh, right now we're at 70 permits, and uh, we're going along with them, cutting it back to 55 and eventually to 40, which will bring it down to a little over 50% of what, the, what they're selling now or, or able to, for fishermen that's able to get them. So that's already, you know, take, you're taking away nearly half of the commercial fishermen that can buy a permit, you're taking it back. And we're for that, even, even, even though I don't like it because if I've got, a, I've got a grandson or a son that hasn't got a permit and he don't get it before this happens, he'll never be able to get one in the next 10 years. That's, I feel bad about that. I, I don't know if there's a way around that or not, but that I feel, really feel bad about that. That, that can happen to somebody. Uh, also, uh, we brought up that uh, we asked the commission to make the six inch nets illegal while the season was closed. And they done that, but they didn't do what we asked. <laughs> they, we asked them to let us put them out the day before season, just like we'd always been doing. The six inch nets have always been legal year round. We've asked to let us put those six inch nets out at noon the day before season opens, whatever that day is determined to be. And uh, we asked for that. They didn't even commission making six inch nets illegal. We done that because we seen a problem that was, you know, from um, fish mortality like big cat or something during the summertime. We asked for that, but we we want the commission. I mean, the commission to consider uh, opening it up 12 noon the day before season for six inch nets to be legal, so that we can do as we did in the past. We normally put out at daylight, but we're asking for 12 noon the day before season, so that uh, we can harvest them the day they become legal to harvest, instead of losing another day of fishing. Because we put them out the day uh, that it's open then we can't harvest them to the next day. We leave them out overnight, you know, 12 hours, 12 to 13 hours. Uh, there's an, uh, the commission is asked to drop down to 12 nets, and uh, we didn't go along with that completely. Some, some fishermen are fishing 20 and 30 nets, and we know that's too many. But we asked for 15, and which we thought, you're going, say a fisherman's 50 fishing 30 nets, that's cutting him back to half. If he's fishing 20, that cuts him back quite a bit, you know, at 25%, you know, to 15. We thought 15 would be a reasonable number, but the commission uh, wanted it to be 12. We asked y'all to consider that. Uh, we're going along with a 38 inch size limit, and that's something we have really didn't want to do in the past, but we feel like this is a, it's time to do something because the commission says, uh, I mean, the TDWR says that we need to, and we're, we're, we're wanting to work with them all we can. But there's just certain things that it's hard to work with. The most important one is doing the eggs on the river, being able to do the eggs on the river. Mike's told you the uh, buyer standpoint of it, but the, now I want to tell you the fisherman standpoint. All right, even, uh, just say we're 15 miles from the boat ramp. The only way to have a good product would, be like, like Mike told you, get, get that fish and get the eggs out of it right then. As soon as you get done, this the way we've been, we've been doing it. If you have to drive 10 miles back to the boat ramp and then back to your nets, even if you run two nets, you've got to, you know, you've got to come all the way back. Then you've got to put them in the truck. Well, what that creates, is, a, is not only you won't, can't get enough gas in your boat to start with, there's no way we're gonna get enough gas in our boat to make that many trips. And it's normally we're 10 miles from the boat route. That's nothing unusual. We're not exaggerating. That's, that's sometime further, but it's, it's not unusual to be 10 miles from the boat route. And it's because, you know, in the wintertime, the water's low and you can't use just any boat route. Also, it, the, it's dangerous when we get loaded uh, you take if we if if we do that but run back and forth to the to the boat ramp 
that 10 mile. Then we got to fight those waves for that whole 10 mile at least five or six times. Even if we had, could carry enough gas, it'd be dangerous for the fishermen. And I'd ask you to please consider that. That's the most, that's the worst thing that could happen if we couldn't, if we couldn't do our eggs on the river. And there is a problem. There's two or three fishermen out there that's not doing right. It's not everybody, I'll guarantee you. TWRA, I believe, knows who they are. The fishermen know who they are. They, they just can't, they just ain't been able to catch them for one some reason or another. But if y'all would work with us on this, we'll help you help the TWRA. Maybe we weed those fishermen out some way or another. We'll we'll do our best because those two or three fishermen are causing this problem right here. Not it's not it's not the it's not the majority of them and like I say they they don't uh, TWA don't know who they are they've got a good idea they've even one of, uh, one of the uh, people from TRA told me that we got a good idea who they are so but the fishermen pretty well do too and if we could just work together some way to get those fishermen caught and that would and I but we'll work with them if that's what it takes to not do this do you have a question for him? Um, Commissioner Cannon? Thank you. This is just me speaking. Okay. So you can do with this, and the other commissioners may disagree. We're not doing any action today. The agency staff has presented what they believe is a reasonable compromise, and they've explained very clearly why we believe as an agency we have to have this kind of dialogue going on. And I don't doubt you one minute. I would say it's the few that are causing the problems for the many in this discussion. So far, what I'm hearing is, and I say this very, very respectfully, so please accept it this way, that it is a rebuttal to what the agency is proposing. You know, it's a rebuttal as to what's wrong with that. And I do better with a sheet of paper in front of me than I do try to depend on my memory of what you all have said. And I guess it would seem appropriate to me, just as every other wildlife issue, fishing issue, to boot, to, you know what the issues are that are driving us here, bring us a proposal that you believe is reasonable in addressing these issues as an alternate, rather than continuing to debate whether the agency or the agency is wrong I appreciate knowing why you believe those points are wrong, but I would ask you, if you would, to take it to the next level, at least for somebody thick-headed like me. There's, here's our problem with what the agency is proposing, but to address this situation, as a fishing community, we would propose blank. And I think that's a reasonable request. I do believe you've got 15 years' worth of information. Don't take this wrong. I don't want to see it. We're here today and we've got current issues, and you've got a current proposal that our staff has worked hard on, and nobody's trying to, to do detriment to the industry, but we've got issues we have got to deal with. There are genuine concerns. So I'd like to hear from you all, other than verbally, right out. Tell us how you think we should address these things, rather than just stopping at the point of what we're doing wrong. I saw this gentleman here come to the front. State your name, please. Can I, can I say one Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, there's uh, somebody else uh, back here. He fishes the Mississippi River a lot. He's wanting to know: uh, Does does uh, the 12 net limit uh, that they're asking for does it go to the Mississippi River and does it pertain to uh, uh, buffalo and catfish also? Let Bobby answer the question. I think I need to go back to that slide. I think before I say anything, let me look at it. Twelve nets. That's statewide, Eric, or is that? Yes. Okay. It is. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. I'm lost. Okay, your answer was. Okay. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Let me ask the question because I know it wants to be asked. These 12 nets that they're proposing, does that regulate how long the nets are? That won't change the regulation that we have already in place about the length of that. What is the length of it then? I'd look it up. Somebody yards. else knows. Eric, do you know okay. how much that? 300 yards? 300 yards. 300 yards. 300 yards. God. This is something that I want to uh, address that has already been addressed by the commission. Uh, the Tennessee Commercial Fishery Fishing Advisory Committee presented this on January the 15th of 2013. We've had no response from it as far as I know of yet. And I'll read, just read you the first paragraph. Tennessee commercial roll fishermen and wholesale roll fishermen dealers ask that the Tennessee Wildlife, Tennessee and Wildlife Commission, along with the Tennessee Commercial Fishing Advisory Committee, contact the officers of offices of U.S. Senator Lamar Alexander and Harold Corker to request that together they have the U.S. Government Accountability Office, GAO, do an audit of the Division of Management Authority of the Division of Scientific Authority as to why Tennessee is the only state that cannot export their paddlefish products. Senator Corker has previously volunteered uh, to do anything he could to help Tennessee commercial fishermen. Uh, this, uh, like I say, was made in 2013, on January the 15th. It was presented by Mike Kelly, and as far as I know, we've heard nothing from the audit. Uh, has there been an audit, and will there be an audit? The commission asked, I think, for an audit back then, but we've heard nothing. And I, I just want to know, is there going to be an audit? Will it take place? Can you respond to that, uh, Director Carter? Or, or I, yeah. Yes, sir. When we got that request, uh, I wrote a letter to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and came to Alexander and to, and to Corker and asked. I did not ask for an audit. Uh, that's a, a process that comes through the U.S. Inspector General's office and through through their inspector, uh, what do they call them? You know, their inspectors that are assigned to each end of division. So in my letter, I asked them to explain to us why we were the only state that was being singled out uh, when the other states had varying regulations and the fact that the water course is all intermingled as to why we were being singled out among all those other states. We did receive letters back from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It was, it was pretty much a... An explanation of why they felt like that Tennessee would be held to this standard because of the intermingling of waterways and, and the fact that the study that was done on Kentucky Lake and Kentucky Lake theoretically at least is among all the other water courses in the state of Tennessee where paddlefish are there. So we didn't specifically ask for an audit because that's a function and that comes through the federal government itself, but we did ask for that explanation and, and it never got to an inspector general's audit. But that was Thank you. Uh, Alan? Yeah, my name is Alan Fine. I'm from Chattanooga, Tennessee. And I have a question. Is the commission concerned with managing the paddlefish population as a resource, or are you more concerned about whether or not Alan Fine catches eggs for his business? And rather than to send you a whole lot of paperwork that you don't want to see, I'd like to know that so I would know what to send you for you to look at. No, there's a complete, it's totally different. Hear what I'm about to say. If we're about preserving a resource, isn't that about preserving your business and, and your opportunity to continue in your business? Don't those things go hand in hand in your mind? Well, to, to, to show you, 
or, or to be able to give this commission the information that I'd like them to see, because I, I disagree with a whole lot of what was said here. You're assuming that it's all right, and I don't want to sit here and rebut everything because y'all want to hear it. I have a lot of stuff in writing, but if I knew that you were interested in managing the paddlefish as a species, or if you were inter interested in managing the egg harvest, I mean, it's, it's a big difference. There is a big I difference. As a difference. commissioner, we're here to represent and protect the resource, you know, and we would love to see that, that the business end benefits from it too, but our response is, well, I don't think we're in, and maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think we're in to regulation of business. We are to here to protect the resource. The, the paddlefish species. So would it, would it surprise anybody on this commission to know that the paddlefish population in the state of Tennessee is stable and has been stable for years? We're, we're, we've got to base our information and our decision based on the information we're given. Well, I understand, but yeah. that my question is, would that, would that make a difference if I could send you the information, not me telling you, but I could furnish you the information that the paddlefish population in the state of Tennessee is stable? We, we, I, we would love I don't speak for the whole commission, but I'd, I'd look at anything you can provide. Well, it's a simple. I mean, you could go to the USGS website, punch in paddlefish study, and you can get that information yourself. I mean, it's right there. That's where I got it. I'd like to ask you the same question I asked Mr. Kelly earlier. Do you share that information with the agency? They know. They have it. I mean, I've, I've, I've sent most of the stuff that I have came from the agency to me. That a prime example was. Three years ago, we asked or requested to reduce the paddlefish permits from 80 to 70. The response back from the agency was, no, we disagree. We think that paddlefish permits should be based on the economy, and anybody that wants one should have one. Now, today you hear them stand up, and they want to limit them to 40. It's hard to comprehend. It seems like whatever we want to do, they're opposed. I don't know how to do it. I, just, I want to give you the information you need. I want you to vote no. And I know you're not going to do that just by me asking you, but I have so much information, most of which has been furnished to me from the state and from U.S. Fish and Wildlife, that I'd like for you to see what you need to see to agree with me. So all I'm asking you is what would it take for me to furnish to you to get you to vote no on this? Well, you know the reason that you would vote for it. I think what we're saying is that we welcome information. I don't, you said USGS, I have no idea how USGS is involved in paddlefish research and population parameters and so forth, but perhaps they are. But if you have something from USGS, I'd, I'd be glad to look at it okay. and to consider it because I think, I only speak for myself, but I think my colleagues all have open minds on this. And what we're about is preserving this species and by doing that, we're, pre we're preserving a way of life for those men and women who benefit from Correct. this and, and doesn't it seem strange to you that none of us are in here complaining that the harvest is what the harvest is, that we're not in here crying that we're going out of business? Does it, doesn't it seem strange that the very people in that industry making their living in that industry aren't complaining? I mean, last August, the, the solder fishermen on Kentucky Lake weren't catching any sauger, and they all screamed and hollered and complained. You know, if we were upset with our catch, we would be the first ones in here complaining. Can I mean, everybody wants to catch more, but it is, you know, it is what it is. Can you explain to me why the poundage of eggs has gone down tremendously that, on the graph that they showed you? Well, sure, that's strictly Kentucky Lake, wasn't it? I, wasn't, I don't think I've seen that first part. Wasn't that just Kentucky Lake where you showed the harvest? Yeah, again. So I mean, I'm it's just the pounds that. of eggs. So let's look at the harvest of fish. The harvest of fish hasn't went down. It's consistent of around 6,000, 6,300 fish, statewide. Well, why do you predict? Why is it the eggs? Pounds Some year, the difference of opinion. I don't believe those fish roll up every year. Some folks, Dr. Batola's report said that they do. The, water runs too much. the last report that Bobby referred to that U.S. Fish and Wildlife did or paid for. In there, they say they don't know if it's every year, every other year, every three years. They don't know. But, you know, if you're asking me, it's because those fish don't grow up every year. One of the reasons that the harvest flow, the harvest is different is uh, 
a couple of things. The agency had kind of been on TVA to change the flows for the spawn of the fish, uh, not just paddlefish, all fish. And the farmers in Hardin County have sued TVA for flooding their bean fields and not controlling the water a little bit better. And that, that lawsuit's going on now and it's a pretty big issue. I know Mr. McDaniel probably knows something about that. But in the middle of all of that, TVA has changed the way they run the dam at Pickwick. And they've changed the way they, they operate. And it's totally different than it was some of these years back. And it affects, it affects it affects our success, you know. Uh, in the in the Patoli report, you go read if you want to read it. It said that the success rate was when the dam was functioning at thirty thousand cubic feet per second. Well, we've been fighting a hundred thousand cubic feet per second since TVA changed the way they operate. The reason we're not griping about the catch, we know what's hindering it. And I, I, to Mr. Ripley, there's a lot of play on words here that's always been endangered, threatened, not going to be no more, you know, like a dinosaur. Over half the water in Tennessee that's got paddlefish is off limits to us. We can't catch them because we won't allow commercial fishing. Paddlefish dying of old age. And if there was a real, real worry about Kentucky Lake, if we was worried that today that the paddlefish are going to go extinct, this man is telling you he'll fill it full of hatchery fish. So that's, that's the way you're operating the sport fishery. You buy hatchery fish, you throw in trout, and you go catch them. And all of the saltwater strife in East Tennessee are hatchery fish that you throw in there. So, so, see, your sport fishery is already overfished because they're throwing in hatchery fish and, and you're having to do that to survive, to sell a license, and you're not having to throw in hatchery fish for us. But, but we're saying if you're so worried about it, this man will throw them in there. Did you want to... Did you want to address... Well, I, I, I would follow up on that too, that those fishermen that harvested those fish, me being one of them, also fishing Kentucky Lake, wasn't fishing Kentucky Lake. We were fishing in East Tennessee on Chickamauga. So if there's nobody fishing on Kentucky Lake, you're not going to be able to harvest anything on Kentucky Lake. You've got to be there to do it, and everybody's in East Tennessee. At that time, everybody was in West Tennessee. So wherever the catch is the most profitable is where we go. So if I can do the same thing in East Tennessee and catch two fish a day, but I can go to West Tennessee and catch five, I'm going to go to West Tennessee. But, but the graph was for the statewide. Was it not for the amount of poundage that was sold or not? Yeah, I have several graphs. One was a statewide graph. But it was down 90%? Okay, I missed it somewhere. I thought one of them was Kentucky Lake. Kentucky Lake is 91% decline. Statewide is down 89%. So again, that's only the fish that are harvested. Those aren't the fish we release. I mean, if you want to see numbers this season, when it opens up, guys, every legal fish, catch it, keep it, bring it in. The harvest will shoot through the roof. But that's not what we want. If that fish doesn't have eggs, we want to release it, even if it's legal to keep. So explain to me again, you're able to take a needle just to see, dry out a few eggs and see take if there's a, eggs it's there? It's like a, a turkey baster needle. Mm -hmm. And you take that needle. Is it as big as a turkey baster? Or? Oh, it's big. Yeah, I don't want to be stuck with it. And you stick it in that fish back underneath toward the back back here in the belly and you pull it out and there'll be eggs on that needle where the liquid comes out. It's sharp edge and it'll bring eggs out. Does and it it's 99.99% no. accurate. So if that needle comes out and it don't have an egg on it, you can let that fish go. And it survives. And it lives. Okay. But, that, you know, harvest and population are two totally different things. And when you base your harvest only on what fishermen bring in, it gives you an unfair picture of what's actually happening. But there has to be a problem if the if the if there the number of amount of eggs coming out of Kentucky Lake has gone now ninety percent in the last ten years. With your so there's got to be a problem if those fish don't have eggs, correct? The, the the fish over there, and what the problem they have is that river's so big and long. When they run that hundred thousand cfm, it's just like when they originally did the study. They couldn't catch enough fish, and they said that 
you know, we wanted to close, we totally wanted to close the lake under an emergency closure. They're running the waters, what we're telling you, on Kentucky Lake so hard and so often, you can't catch. You can put your nets out, they bow, they blow down river, they trash, and they collapse. So it's harder to fish Kentucky Lake commercially with all that current and make money. It's easier to go to Chickamauga Lake and fish. Now, we have the same problem with current, but they only run 46,000 cubic feet over there. Now, it's narrow and different, but each lake fishes differently. And you can fish Chickamauga where you can't fish over here. And we do it to make money. So we're not going to be over here fishing just to put nets in the river. Even if the fish are there, that doesn't mean you can catch them. But everything you have is harvest. And that harvest report and the population are two totally different things. And the population in the state is stable. Probably 90% of the paddlefish in the entire state of Tennessee, if you really looked at it, with the closed waters, which is, you know, he was talking the limited entry is the most radical form of management. I think, uh, or the most drastic, the most radical are no-go zones. And those are all your closed waters. And over 50% of the, the Tennessee River is closed. It's a no-go zone. 100% of those fish are protected. Bobby tells you they, they want to do a basin-wide management because those fish come from those closed waters into open waters and vice versa and back and forth. If you caught every paddlefish, 100%, every one of them on Kentucky Lake, you would not hurt the paddlefish as a species in the state of Tennessee. And that lake will repopulate itself simply because those fish from those closed zones come back into Kentucky Lake. I'll ask Bobby here, and they've said it before, the commercial fishery will collapse prior to stock collapse. You still stand by that? Well, it came from him. It was information that we got from the fisheries people. And, and basically the agency says that the paddlefish commercial fishery will collapse prior to stock collapse. That we'll go out of business before the paddlefish has a chance to go extinct or the, the population to collapse where it can't come back. Yes, sir. Commissioner Cannon. about what's it take for us, what information do we need to vote no. That is a question that cannot and should not be answered by this commission as to what it takes to vote no. What you can provide us is, and I've said this a minute ago, you've heard where the agency is. You've heard why the agency is where they are. It's very clear the, commu the commercial industry disagrees with what's being proposed. That message is received. What I want to know is, A, why do you disagree with it? And I don't want to know it based on the back and forth in this room today, quite frankly. Get, just as the agency has done with this PowerPoint, and it's up there and can be read, tell us why you disagree with where they are. If you disagree that the paddlefish resource is not in detriment, as has been presented today, then tell us why you believe that but give us some facts other than I believe, all right? Oh, I it's, the same, it's the same thing we ask the deer hunters. It's the same thing we ask every other group that we serve here. And then tell us what you would propose. If you want to propose putting fish back in, propose that, suggest that. Whatever you all want to propose, get that on paper. The industry's up here. This back and forth, the thing it's accomplished is, is that there is a, it's established that there's a gap in this. How would you propose this gap be filled? Bobby's been straight up. The information has been, you've seen the graphs, there's some scientific components to that. If you disagree with it, shoot it down, but shoot it down scientifically. That's the fairest thing to do. Our staff is not saying we guess or we believe. They're saying, here's what the scientific data is telling us. And that's what we ask them to rely on. What Commissioner Stroud said a minute ago about for those folks in your industry who are increasing the detriment, what's believed to be the detriment to the industry, propose how we should deal with that. I think he had some words of wisdom there, more than just some words of wisdom. They were words of wisdom. But bring us something. The back and forth, I appreciate it, and I am willing to listen as long as we need to listen. Uh, 
Oh, no, I agree. I don't want race. to stand up here all day either. I've got to go then, not quite as far as you, but I'm going right back to Chattanooga. You and I've got a little bit of a drive. Yeah. But that's what – that would be my hope. I can't make you do anything. But that would be my personal hope and what would help me the most in hearing your all side of this. And I do appreciate you all taking the time today to come here. Truly do. And the mic is still open. I'm not trying to cut that off. But at some point, this guy is going to need something that's a one, two, three, four. That's just the way I think. And I would respectfully offer that's the way this commission probably will look at this because that's the way our agency is presenting this. So, okay, so just, just so I'm clear and then I'm done, this commission is concerned with managing the paddlefish population in the state of Tennessee. Commissioner. Let me, let, let me, let me interrupt you. Just let me answer that by asking Bobby, because I've had this conversation. There is a difference between managing for the species survival and managing for a, a viable egg market. There's a difference. That's exactly that. You've asked I, it perfectly. I understand that because I've argued what you're arguing. But that's our charge, and Bobby sent me what, what our responsibility, our mission. And I, I don't know whether you got it or not, or you can repeat it, but our mission is not only to provide, in this instance, not only protect the species, but it is to, to maintain a viable, basically, egg market, where you know where, where there continues to be an egg market after you're gone. <laughs> so that you don't overfish it. So that changed my opinion on what I need to do because that's, that's in the law. That's what we're supposed to do. So, but you are correct. Managing so the species does not go extinct is different from managing for a consistent egg harvest. And there is a difference in that. Right, and for us, in, in a viable business, you said, correct? I mean, do it now. we still have to be in business. The commercial fishery is a viable exactly. business. It's our responsibility to help you do that, whether you like it or not. I, I, I'm, I'm confused here by what you're saying, Commissioner Cox, in that. I thought that the byproduct of a, of a good resource was the fact that there was an industry that, that these folks could make a living on. But I didn't and, think and, we were and involved in all the trying to regulate whether they how good it is for them i thought it was just a byproduct well, what, of a good resource we're supposed to we're supposed to manage and i hope bobby can find what the what what the statute says I, you, i've got that but okay. before i mean even before the the law that the commercial fishing law was passed in 2011 uh, our job is to uh to manage for uh the the, the continuance of the population we've had this argument before you've said if they catch every one of them but one, it's still going to be one there. But um, we have to do more than that. I and mean, our job is to manage the population. Uh, we have to manage for the fishermen. We have to manage for the fisheries, too. Um, we have to satisfy questions asked by the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, in order to, to maintain it. There, there are a lot of people here there's, that are not speaking up that probably will never speak up, that have spoken with me, have spoken with Eric. Uh, that tell me that I've done a terrible job because we've let these regulations go as long as they have without doing something to fix it because they're not catching fish. And, but just since 2011, we are now charged with, um, we are directed to promulgate reasonable rules and regulations necessary to promote commercial fishing activity as an economically viable commercial enterprise in Tennessee. So we're now charged with doing that uh, more specifically.